to fake the venues. Get your house in order because he's coming back again. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come now to our evening study as we talk about getting out the boat. A little later tonight, God, we want to share with them how not to discipline your child. And so, God, we come asking you to bless us and keep us at this time. And we know that we can't do anything without you. We know we have people sick, people shut in, people going through changes, people who are having ups, people who are having downs, people who are sick, can't find their way, people who are worried. But God, you are still a way maker, a burden bearer, and a heavy load carrier. So we come now before you with thanksgiving and praises for you being our God. And besides you, there's none other, never have been one, never will be one. You are it. You are our God. And we can come before you with thanksgiving and praises for you being our God, how you kept us when we could not keep ourselves, how you blessed us when we didn't know how to get blessed, how you encouraged us when we were discouraged. So we thank you, dear Father. In the name of thy son, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. And thank God. I want to talk to you for a little while tonight about resilience. And I want to use Joseph as an example of being resilient when you have trials and turmoils and troubles and difficulties and ups and downs, when you've been betrayed, when you've been, uh, when you should be discouraged, but yet when you're in God, you can be resilient in the midst of all your troubles, trials, and tribulations. Come right on up front here, and we'll be ha glad to help you and have you. Thank you for being here with us tonight. So we want to talk about, uh, we're still in the book. In the book, we're still talking about uh, being resilient and we're still talking about uh, get out the boat. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out the boat. I got me one of those young folks with me tonight, y'all. She said, I want to come up there with a pass that. You can come on. Glad to have you. So we want to... Uh, uh, resilient people exercise control rather than passively resign. So what that means when you're in trouble, what that means when you got turmoil, what that means when you, you, you know, when, when life is difficult, when your friends have turned on you and they have done things that you wouldn't expect them to do, you got to be resilient. Uh, 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 you got to exercise control rather than passively resign because it's easy to just give up. It's easy to give out. And it's easy to give in. But when you're resilient through God, you won't do that. Uh, one of the deacons today came down, came in the church, walked past the hall, wanted to give me something from, from his wife. I was in a little small meeting, and I looked up and saw this hat on his head about Vietnam. And, and so when I did that, uh, he was uh, walking down the hall, the chair, for the deacon said, uh, start talking about who and, and the Marine Corps and all of that. And I say, uh, that's why he was in the Army. He reached back and say, gave me the thumbs up. Cause, and so resilience, why did I go and give you that illustration? Because I want to start out by talking about prisoners of war. Uh, a major theme that characterizes resilient, a resilient person is their surprising exercise of control in stressful, stress-filled situations, uh, uh, stress-filled environments. So imagine, you can only imagine what it may have been like for somebody to be in a stressful situation or a prisoner of war. Many POWs and hostages report that the single most stressful aspect of their ordeal was the realization that they had lost command over their self-being. They had lost command over their existence. Can you imagine being in a situation such as POWs and I've lost control of my existence. I have to do everything this enemy tell me to do. When he tell me to do it, how he tell me to do. At the same time, I'm facing the possibility of dying or being killed. Because being in prison, being locked up. I'll give you an example of a young man. I kind of mentioned today, I'll wait till I build it up in a sermon, what he was telling me about. He got in trouble. 
he went to jail. He left jail, he went to prison. And when he got to prison, the first day he got there, the first thing he said was, this is not something I like, and I don't ever want to do this again. And he spent 15 years in there, and he got out, and he made sure he lived up to the fact that he would never go to prison again. Because he, had, he realized he had lost his own self-existence. He had lost control. You go to prison, you lose control of your self-existence. And so then, in this book uh, of uh, resilient people exercising control rather than passive resign, it's a, biblical, it's, it's a biblical story that goes with it. Why you say that? Those who lapse into a state of passive acceptance, what observers of the Korean prisoner camps uh, said uh, in the 1950s called give up, give up idols. You know how we used to, we use that word. You may not use that word in your language, but us elders used to say uh, the word idols. So there was a moment when you in a situation where you can't have control of yourself and you have give up idols. In other words, you know, you just give up. You know, you, you, everything come over you. You got this give up idols going on. I don't know what term, what term would you young people use when you want to give up on something? You want to quit. What, you, what, 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 is, what words you might use to say, well, I give up on that. I, I quit. I, I, I just want to be bothered with it. I'm done, see? See? Well, I, I, I picked up on that, so I can say done. I'm just done with that. Uh, mama, I'm done with you right now. <laughs> that might not go over too well, everybody. I'm just saying. But when you pick up on that, so when they walk away from you, they're saying, I'm done. See how I picked up on that? All right. So that's called give up idols. I'm done. I just can't do no more, so I give up. And so then, where, 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 where the least likely to survive and recover. If you get to the point where you give up in that type of situation, you're least likely to survive and you're least likely to recover. That's what happens when people get to the emotional state where they want to commit suicide. They're having a give up itis. They're having a done moment. I just don't want to live anymore. I just can't take this no more. I can't handle my friends talking about me. That's why I tell you about that social media being so dangerous now. And so and a lot of people have committed suicides as a result of that social media. That's dangerous. Anytime social media is causing some young person to kill themselves, uh, they got to the point where they're done. They got to the point where they got to give up items. They got to the point where they quit. They got to the point where they don't care. And they're saying, it's not worth living. Same thing happened with people in prison of wars. When they get to that point where they give up, they're likely, they're least likely to survive and recover. Amazingly enough, however, when I get to tell you this story from the biblical perspective, losing control over their daily lives was more critical to their psychological well-being, okay, imagine that, than their more obvious suffering. It's the psychological, the threats, the hunger, the beatings, and the isolation. That brings about a psychological change in your life. Uh, to be in any kind of environment where somebody is shooting at you, that's a psychological change. Just this past, was it yesterday? Yesterday was Tuesday, Monday. I don't remember these days every now and then. But... I went to a press conference, it was Monday. And we were down the street from uh, the Dollar General where they assassinated those three people. That's what I call that assassination. Uh, and Senator Davis, when she got up to speak, because she was kind of holding back and I was kind of behind her saying, no, you need to, say something because when you have an emotional state you need to talk that out of you you need to pray that out of you but literally you could see her still being nervous still being uh, emotionally impacted 
by the fact of knowing she was right down the street from where those three people got killed. That's a heart problem, that's an emotional problem, and, 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 and some people who experience that need to have some emotional support and counseling of some kind. So, uh, but, but, but when you are in these type situations and losing control over your daily lives, that has a psychological impact. Uh, more than obvious the suffering of threats and hunger and beatings. Your mind, they say, is a terrible thing to waste. But you can put some stuff in your mind that will penetrate down in your heart, that will run down in your nerves and mess your body up and get stressful and worried over things. Same thing with Korea had held true in Vietnam. Vietnam era, Vietnam veterans. Prisoners would place themselves on strenuous exercise regiments, memorize stories, or invent new games. Some ordered their time by keeping a careful census of insects in their cell. Now you would think that that is not uncommon. However, I've been in some strange places in the military, right? And I spent a lot of it down on the ground in the dirt. You can see some strange things laying down on the ground in the dirt. I saw insects laying down there that I had never seen before. Didn't know they even existed. All different colors, all, di all different shapes, all, everything you can think of. And to, and to realize now, from this perspective, God's creation. And so, when I saw them, I started looking for others. A couple of times I saw snakes, so I, you know, I ain't rolling with that one. But I'm just saying, you know, uh, of all different colors. You look up in the tree. The snake, the leaves were green and everything. The snake was green. You couldn't even see him because he's camouflaged, all right? But, but I'm just saying uh, when you think about that, these, these creating these games and memorizing things and stories, and uh, some ordered their time by keeping a careful sense of insects in their cell. So when you see those movies and a guy has a mice coming into the cell, that helped keep his sanity or her sanity, or you got a cockroach riding around. Now, we see a cockroach, we stomping it. We taking it out. We done with it. So, 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 he, 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 he it got to go. Cause I don't know whether it's a male or female, but it got to go, so. But imagine you're in a situation where you're in isolation, you're by yourself, that becomes your attention getter. I guess the best movie we could pull up on that would be, uh, uh, the movie uh, when the man was stuck on the island for FedEx. Is it called Castaway? Have you ever seen that movie, Castaway? You might sit down with your grandparents and look at that movie until you say, I'm done with it. But, but, I'm <laughs> but he was cast away on the island. He was by himself, but he had a uh, so volleyball or soccer ball. Volleyball, see that? Now y'all watch that movie, see? I, did, I was trying to, I thought it was a soccer ball. But he, see there? Mr. Wilson, hey, Mr. Wilson became his friend. He painted Mr. Wilson? Why couldn't it be Mrs. Wilson? I don't know, but I'm just saying. But he painted Ms., Mr. Wilson and, and he messed around and he lost Mr. Wilson. And he had, a, almost had an emotional breakdown. That's how life is. Well, uh, so, so here we are. Uh, they g ingenuously defied defy their captives' orders not to communicate with each other. Some of them developed secret signals such as taps on the wall that stood for letters of the alphabet. Some prisoners used strokes of his broom to send messages in code. Another sent messages by dragging his sandals. Thus, the POWs encouraged each other and reminded themselves, listen to this, Reminded themselves that their bodies had been captured, but their spirits had not. That's the significance of holding on to your spirit 
and your faith and your belief in God. It will get you through things. So let's switch the narrative now and look at that. I've been talking about prisons and being locked up and doing things. Joseph. See, Joseph in the Bible was a prisoner. And he went through some stuff. First of all, uh, his brothers didn't like him because he had that coat. His brothers didn't like him because he was the favorite child. You the favorite grandchild? Yeah, Pastor, I'm the favorite grandchild. So, so, uh, you know, you know, you, 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 I'm just trying to, trying to help you out. Did you, hear, did you hear what happened back then when you got baptized Sunday? You the favorite grandchild. Now, don't go tell nobody I said that, but I'm just, you know, because they're going to get mad at you. So, <laughs> but, but here it is. When you think about that, Joseph, uh, he was uh, thrown in a, in a pit. His own brothers did it to him. They sold him to the Egyptians. God had him to go down to the Egyptians. He became in charge. So he is in prison now, far from home, separated from his father, betrayed by his own brother, surrounded by strangers who brought and sold him. His robe is long gone, stolen by his brothers, ripped by the shreds, covered with blood, and presented to Jacob as evidence that he was dead. That is so sad. But here's the catch. It is precisely at the time when the storm hits that the writer makes the most striking statements he will ever make about Joseph. The most striking thing that would ever be said about any human being. And I apologize for you tonight. I, I was, uh, had, was gonna have worksheets, but the com as you know, computers, digital stuff went offline and I couldn't get it back online to print it out. But, uh, Far from home, he's separated from his father, betrayed by his brothers, kidnapped just by slave traders, surrounded by strangers. The writer says, the Lord was with Joseph. If you go back and you check and read the stories about people who were in prisons or prisons of wars, those who didn't know God, they found him. And those who had God, they held on to him. Because it became a spirit set, because they had to go within themselves and find out what is it that make me want to live? What is it that make me want to hold on? I got my family back home. I got my children back home. I got my parents back home. You know, I got my country back home. You know, I done lost all that. Joseph understood that the Lord was with him. So I have to ask y'all a fundamental question. I mean, a basic question was, when trouble come in your life, who's with you? Now, I know who want to be with you when trouble come in your life, Satan and his demons. So the battle happens when trouble come, Satan is at you on one hand, God's trying to help you on the other hand, and Satan make things so dark and make seem like things are going to be so depressing and make seem like things are going to be so impossible you start looking at that rather than looking at and for God. Make sense? So the Lord was with Joseph. Imagine what happened to his courage and confidence when he found out that after the worst had happened to him, it led to the best for him. So how do we take our worst moments in life and realize that God is teaching us something at that moment to help us be better in our life? Now, when you're down, you don't, sometimes you don't think of that. For instance, there are some people that's been down so long, they don't think on how to get up. There's some people that's been oppressed for so long, they don't think how to become un, 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 unoppressed. So, uh, but, 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 but imagine what happened. The Lord was with Joseph. He could face the Rockies after that, after all. He could face the moments after all. So if you know that God is with you, everybody who's going to listen to this and listening tonight and will listen at it in the future, when you know God is with you, you can trust that he's going to take care of you. Now, if you don't feel like God is with you, that's when you need to have a prayer moment with God. And you simply need to ask God and say to God, God, listen, I made mistakes and I know it. God, I've fallen short and I know it and I ask you to forgive me. But God, I need you to come into my life 
And when you come in my life, I need you to come into my heart. And I can't do this no more. God waiting on you to turn your problems over to him. And when you turn it, and when you really turn it over to him, don't mean that you're not going to have to work through some things. When if you need a job, you need to go ask for a job. You need to knock on the door. You need to seek a job. Or you need to get on that laptop or computer and request a job. Does that make sense? You know, nowadays it's a computer. Now, I want to tell young people, and everybody listen to me, the 1st of June, as I'm talking about Joe, the 1st of June, we're having a business, uh, a mini business conference here. And we're going to invite anybody who's aspiring to open a business, anybody who has a business, any nonprofits that's doing nonprofit work in churches, we want to invite them in. And first of all, if they're aspiring to be a business, we're going to show them how to open a business. But they just got to bring what's in their heart to do it. I would tell you as a young person, you can have your own business now. You could be a multimillionaire before you get out of high school if you really try. But uh, there's a possibility that uh, also we want to hire single mothers who have children and young teenagers to do work. And the and only thing you're going to need is a laptop. And the goal is that there's a many businesses, millions of businesses in this country that need somebody to do their, to put on their uh, Facebook, put on their, put in their multimedia stuff. And if you really do it and really want to do that, you could probably make somewhere close to $5,000 a month within two weeks. I mean, literally. But you just got to do the work. Now, uh, that's just... I always have this thing about you in stress, you need a job, well, we need to help you find one. Uh, and if you want us to help you find one, then you can come here and be part of this ministry and what we're doing, and we're going to do that. So just keep that and share that word as you move forward. Joseph, he got a job, and God gave it to him. What you mean? God touched the heart of the king and the king knew Joseph was smart and the king gave Joseph in charge over the entire kingdom. His job was to run everything that the king thought he couldn't run. And he brought in, he produ and he brought in the wealth that the king wanted to bring in. All right, so even though Joseph had lost his freedom, Joseph refused to think of himself as powerless. Even though you don't have a job now, that doesn't mean you're powerless. Even though you want to get a job, that don't mean you're powerless. Even though you have a business and your business is not going right, that don't mean you're powerless. You just need a helping hand to show you how to get it. God can do that. God just gave you an opportunity when I opened my mouth. I just said a laptop. The business is going to the corporation. You sent out and fill the multimedia because it costs them a lot of money to hire multimedias, more so if they were to hire independent people to do what they want to do. So anyway, but it's available for you. Hear us put that on our web page, put that on our Facebook, put that on Instagram, encourage people to come to that uh, meeting that we're going to have. Uh, I guess they call it networking. Yes. So even though he had lost his freedom, he began to show remarkable amounts of uh, initiatives in a not autonomy because the Lord was with him. So he could show initiatives and he could show that he could be his own person because he knew that God was with him. You can be, sh you can have initiatives and you can be autonomous because that's just some people can't work in the public life. Y'all better hear what I'm telling y'all. There's some people, they can go from job to job to job to job and they never satisfied because they're not really doing what they want to do. So they go to this job and get fired, or they go to that job and quit, or they go to the next job and get fired, or they go to this job and get aggravated. That means you need to find out what's in your heart, what you want to do to be successful, and let God and other people show you how to do it. That's why everybody got so many different gifts. Joseph had the gift of running a kingdom. 
Watch what he said. The scripture, in fact, have a quite thorough account of prisoners of wars and hostages who refuse passivity. You can't be passive just because you having a problem. And the Bible is full of them. Daniel, he was taken into exile along with some other folks. He in exile, but he took control of his diet. He said to the king, the king said, Daniel, I want you to run the kingdom. And he said, you can have all my food. Daniel said, I don't want, want your, your meat. I don't want, just let me eat my way. So we have the Daniel diet. Now, I was on the Daniel diet. Didn't eat no meat. I did quite well, lost weight. But I broke it when I saw porterhouse steak. And what really broke it, it made me go to Longhorn to get that porterhouse steak. That's a lot of meat, man. They told me that Tuesday, after I presented my uh, presentation for my uh, doctoral degree, they say, congratulations, you are now Reverend Dr. R.L. Gundy. I say, I'm going to celebrate, get me a porterhouse. <laughs> I'm through with the Daniel diet. Okay, I'm just saying, so, 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 but, but, but I'm being open and honest, you know, you, you, you know, I lasted, you know, and, and I was feeling good and I didn't eat no meat and I had vegetables and boy, I was hungry some days. Ooh, Jesus. But, and when I got hungry, God helped me. God helped me make it through this and it works. Okay. So Daniel was in exile, he took it to, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. Peter, P P Peter, Peter, Peter and other apostles refused to accept a gag order against preaching the gospel as a get out of jail free card. Now, we call that in today's society snitching. They, they get a get out to jail free card by snitching on somebody else or in many cases, lying on somebody else so they could get out. They were guilty, but they lied on somebody else and they let them out. That was a get out of jail free card. I, I, I'm just, it is, that's, that's just what it is. So, but, but Paul, but, but Peter said, he's gonna preach the gospel. Now, did he die because he preached the gospel? Yes, but that's the sacrifice you make, you know, I preach the gospel, I'm social justice minded, I, I eat it, I sleep it, I breathe it, I think it, and people slam me all the time. You know what I mean by slamming, right? Yeah, they sl slam and people talk about me yeah, all the time. So, so but, when, when, but when you know God with you, you don't worry about that, you just keep doing what God would have you to do and, 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 and humble yourself with God. And he'll elevate you where he wants you to be. It's like this. It's called an inverted pyramid. Inverted pyramid. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. You stay down here and operate in the Holy Spirit. And you do everything you can to help other people and empower other people. And when God gets ready, he'll elevate you. Don't let people do it. Let God do it. Now, in the process of God elevating you when you're down here and you're trying to help other people, people will use you. People will abuse you. People will say all kind of stuff about you. But stay down here with God. And when he get ready, he gets your enemy out the way. I promise you, I know that to be very, very, very true. I could tell y'all some stories, and you'll say, no, nah, Pastor. And I say, yeah. When you turn it over to God, he will move your enemies out your way. You better believe that. I'm just here to tell you. So Peter, but Paul and Silas took control of their time by holding a sing-along about midnight. Y'all remember that story about Paul and Silas? Were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and as if the other prisoners had a choice. What happened? Faith believes that with God, we are never helpless victims. Y'all remember that story about... They was in the in the jail and 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 and, and they were singing hymns stuff like that. What happened to the what happened to the doors of the jail? They open up. 
You know, I mean, things change. And, 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 and so uh, God and the prisoners were listening to them as if the other prisoners had a choice. Faith believes that with God, we are never helpless victims. So Joseph, which is where I was, even though a slave worked hard to please both the master he was working for and the Lord. Now, I'm going to underline that word masters because from a theological perspective and from a world perspective and from a, a human rights perspective and from a, uh, uh, a, a American and African descent perspective and from a Black Lives Matter perspective and from a feminism movement and stuff like that, when you use that word master, he served the master in the Lord. People would take that master and take it out of perspective and take it out of place and said, I ain't serving nobody. Yeah, you think you're not. You got a job, you serving somebody. You just ain't calling them the master. Mm-hmm. And they paying your, 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 your check. So I'm just saying, I throw that in there just to knock all that foolishness away because that's not what this is about. God used Joseph to work for the king of the kingdom to get Joseph in the place where he was running the kingdom and the master was just going home, sitting down, sleeping and eating and going to sleep. All right. Here's the key. Even though it wasn't his dream, even though his dream seemed dead, Joseph applied himself diligently to the task at hand. I would have been tempted to give up. This isn't what I'd sign up for. I may have to work for Potiphar, but I don't have to like it. But Joseph, even though a slave, worked hard to please both the master and the Lord. There's a progression in the story. We are told that Joseph was in the house, meaning that he was not simply working in the field. Uh, now, if I go back to the slavery days, you had the house folks and you had the field folks. Hmm. And the house folks had a little bit better than the field folks. It's just a reality. Uh, but I would tell you a story, and I'm going to close about, because some people, when you start talking about the house folks and the field folks, they got a problem with it. But uh, this text says that Joseph found favor in his part of her sight and attended him. Now he is ex-executive assistant. He's the CEO. And the king is the chairman of the board or the chairman of the company. So I tell this story uh, to kind of put things in perspective. Uh, the, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, a lot of people don't know this story. A lot of people don't know this story. And after Bible study, we went through for this evening because I got a meeting and I have to deal with it. Um, in Birmingham, Alabama, you're too young, but you may have seen some videos about it. They used to turn dogs on the people. And they would bite them. You've seen that, right? They turned the water holes on them and all of that. They were kids your age who changed my life, made things better for me and your grandmother and your granddad and all of us elders sitting around here, to include Paul. They made our life better. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old young. But they locked a lot of the young people up. I'm talking about Joseph as an illustration to close this. They locked a lot of the young people up. And the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was in Birmingham, and the people in Birmingham did not want them there. They wanted them gone. Follow my story. There was a when they locked them up, they would not let the SCLC members get to the jail to take care of the young ladies and take care of what they needed and to make sure that they was all right. Got it? 
but there was a house person in Birmingham who owned a store. He was respected by people on both sides. He didn't make any noise. He ran his store and people came and bought stuff from him. And because he was respected, they had a meeting and they said, you know, we got all these young people in jail. We got to do something to protect them and make sure that they're all right. We need to know whether they're feeding them. We need to make sure they got personal items that they need and everything else. So someone told them, well, let's go talk to brother so-and-so. And so he, they, he get along with, with folks. I'm saying this to say. He was like Joseph. They went to him. And they talk to him. They say, look, we know that the people in the city respect you, and they listen to you on both sides, and we need your help. We need to see about these young people. So he said, uh, and we need to send some things to them, but they're not going to let us take it to them. So they bought all the supplies that they thought that the young ladies needed out there in the prison. He was really concerned about them. And he said... <coughs> This is a true story. He said, you need to also buy a case of half a pint of liquor. It was gin. He put all the supplies. They paid him for all the stuff. They put him all the supplies, put it in his car. He drove out to the prison where the young ladies were locked up. He got out there, and they uh, said to him, what you doing out here? I ain't calling no name. What you doing out here at this time of night? You know, what's going on? He said, well, you know, it's a little cold out here, and y'all got all these young people locked up, and, you know, that SCLC, they need to get out of town. And, but, you know, they ain't going to go nowhere if y'all got all these young people in here, and y'all need to make sure these young people are taken care of. So I want to bring them some supplies. And since it's a little nippy out here, I got something in my trunk just for y'all. Y'all see where I'm going? He took out the nip. Us old folks used to call it a nip. Like you say, done, they had a nip. You know what a nip is? They drank. They was taking a nip. You just learned something, okay? So he gave the guards a nip, and they say, come on in. Go on and take that stuff in there, because we like you. We want them SCLC people to be gone. You have to humble yourself sometimes in order to get what you really want from other people. So they was able to take what they need. And you got to work with both sides. There are some good Republicans. There are some good Democrats. There are some bad Republicans. There are some bad Democrats. But you got to work with both sides in order to get something done. You can't, you can't close your mind off because inherently God said that there's some good in everybody. You just got to find it. Even that Ku Klux Klan out there, there's some good in him somewhere. You know, but you just got to find it. So the meeting, the meeting point is to do what Joseph did. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with SCLC that night. See what I'm saying? So they was able to accomplish what they needed to accomplish, and they just sent somebody else to do it. So the house person is not always a bad person. That's the long part of that story. You know, if, if that's what it takes to achieve what you need to achieve to help people, then you need to do that to help them. It, it doesn't hurt uh, the, the, uh, at the end of the day, okay? So in this story about Joseph, he was resilient. The SCLC was resilient. Daniel was resilient because they trusted God and not man. Paul was resilient and Silas, and Peter was resilient because they trusted God and not man. So that as a result, they were able to accomplish what they needed to accomplish. So I say that to say to all of us sitting here tonight, you got to be resilient in this, this fight. Like you're young right now, but you, you can start building your resilience up now because there's so much going to come after you as you go through this world. But if you got 
like you got baptized and you got God in your life and you let God work through this, if you really want to run Satan and his demons away, all you got to do is say, in the name of Jesus, Satan, get away from me or get behind me. And people will say, oh, something wrong with her. She, she done lost it. They do do that, you know. Well, I know, Pastor, I probably can't do that in the school, but yes, you can. All right, so resiliency. All right, I'm going to give you all 12 points tonight before I close. Uh, you're not going to be able to take all these notes down, but you can go back and look at it a little bit later. Uh, it was not disobedient until the, no, I'm sorry, that's not the one I want to do. Oh, yeah. 2 Timothy 1 through 7, in the CEV, it says, the Spirit gives us power, love, and self-control. Because we're just talking about resilience and all of that. Um, and it does. But the other part of that is that if you want self-control, you just got to do certain things to get it. But The question is, what do you want to do? So in order to be happy in life, you must start doing the right things and stop doing the wrong things. That's simple. You, that, that, that's just simple. You don't have to try and figure that out. It's just simple. And only you can control you. So when these people and young people and stuff, people are doing stuff, they're doing it because they're not controlling themselves. They're letting Satan control them. Does that make sense? So guard your heart above all else. If you guard your heart and don't let Satan in, then Satan can't be in control. I, I had originally uh, planned to, uh, something came up. I had originally planned to uh, share with, talk to you all about 12 things you need 12 things to do to create a juvenile delinquent. And so I, I, I decided not to do that. I want to save it later as I, as I uh, teach some other things. But if you want a juvenile delinquent, keep spoiling your child. If you want a juvenile delinquent, keep giving them everything they want. You want a juvenile delinquent, don't discipline them. Now that seems strange but if you don't you're going to create a ju you can create a juvenile delinquent by doing too much for them uh, and they think that you owe them something amen all right let's pray God we thank you for our time together we ask that you would bless us and we thank you for those who are here and we pray that as we continue to move forward that you would give us the desires of our heart but God bless our children bless the the bus driver and uh, bless the families of our children that they could be here. We pray this and ask this in Christ's name. Amen.